All right, guys, let's continue. So as I said, this is going to be a separate recording and I'm gonna post it under lecture 14. What I said in the first part of the class will be posted on under lecture 13. So there will be part one and part two. The first part of this recording would be part two of that, okay? And as I said, whatever I said in the first half of the class in the previous recording is going to be part of your quiz too. But whatever you say now, and the next lecture and so on will be part of your last quiz, which is quiz three, okay? Uh, so now I want to kind of like go a little bit lower and talk about the main memory. So we kind of understood the cache, the difference between different des design decisions, the miss rate, miss penalty, L1, L2, exclusivity, inclusivity, what do we do with stores and loads and, and all those things. And hopefully you do the, the project and you will understand this a little bit better as well. Uh, but let's talk about other important things, including the main memory, okay? Uh, so if you think about this kind of structure that we have here, as I said, we have kind of what we call a memory hierarchy, right? So we have our registers that are very, very fast, very, very close to the CPUs. Then we're gonna have our, our caches. We typically have multiple levels of cache, typically at least two. Uh, in L1, we have a separate I cache and D cache. In L2 and L3, we typically have uh, a unified cache. Uh, the last level of cache, we usually call it LLC. LLC, if you have only two level of cache, your L2 becomes LLC. If you have three level of cache, your L3 becomes LLC. If you have four levels of cache, your L4 becomes LLC, okay? But generally, if you heard the term LLC, is the last level of the cache, which is usually level three. So in most modern systems, you have three levels of the cache, okay? But then after this cache, I have two other things that I want to discuss and talk about in this lecture and probably some part of next lecture. And that is the main memory and the disk. If you remember, main memory is, the, is this thing that we use, this technology we use called DRAM. And usually it's in order of gigabytes. So like eight gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's volatile, which means that if I turn my computer off, the data inside the DRAM is gone. But then since I need a volatile, a non-volatile memory, and then usually this eight to 16 is not enough, I need terabytes of data. I add another layer of, of, uh, of data, which we call disk. And this is in order of like hundreds of gigabytes or usually in order of terabytes. But it's very, very slow. But the good thing about this is that it's non-volatile, which means that if I even turn off my computers, I still have the data there, right? Uh, typically together, we call this main memory. Uh, so when I say memory, I mean both of them combined. I'm gonna actually describe how do we actually see the unified view of my disk and my DRAM at the same time. But when I ever say the main memory, I basically means both of them at the same time. And then I'm gonna distinguish between disk and, and, and DRAM later, okay? Uh, so this is the thing that I said. Important thing about your main memory, when we are talking about the DRAM and the disk combined, uh, the data that goes there is always a hit, right? So there is no address that is not available in both of your disk and DRAM, right? Whatever you do there, the data is always there, okay? Because you have the entire address of space there, okay? So your data is always there. Well, of course, the data might not be in DRAM, it might be in disk, or it could be in DRAM, not in the disk. Uh, but when I'm talking about the unified version of main memory, which what I'm talking about the rest of this lecture, when I say I go to the main memory, it means that the data is always there. So there is no notion of miss, okay? But of course, there is a huge latency difference between DRAM and this, and in later half of the class, I'm gonna talk about this, okay? So in order to kind of say that, okay, we have this unified memory that everything is there, the question now becomes, how do we store those everything? What's kind of like, the, what's the format that we are using? And how does that translate into our performance? Because remember, at the end of the day, I want to be able to access this data as fast as possible, right? So if we, if we assume that my memory is this unified thing, this linear unified things, which was the idea that we started all the way from the first lecture in this class, 
And if I have multiple different programs and each program is combination of different data and different instructions and maybe some stack and heap and so on and so forth, if I want to see how do I store this, you know, different programs into my memory, then I have to basically see that like, what's the kind of rationale that I'm storing this program into my main memory? How do I access it and so on and so forth. The big thing when we are to start talking about this is that we need to make sure that my programs are isolated from each other. This is the kind of the, the, the main category, the main criteria for storing things. That my program one should not be able to change things in program two, and program two should not be able to change things in program one, and so on and so forth. The only thing that can, can change things is technically my operating system. Everybody else should not be able to change things from each other, and that's what we call the principle of isolation, okay? If we didn't have isolation, then you might open your Chrome and your Chrome can essentially update your Google Drive or, or your Google Doc or your Microsoft Word, right? You can open your emails and then you can you know, access a website, right? Uh, this should not be possible, right? So it should be perfectly isolated from each other, which means that my data and instruction in one program should not be by any means be, you know, be modified by other programs. That's the basic principle of any system, computer systems that we have. Otherwise, it won't work at all, okay? It won't be secure, it won't work. So, uh, based on this isolation, we can, for example, like, you know, say, okay, I'm gonna like, you know, statically isolate things and put them into, uh, this is so annoying. Uh, so I can isolate them and say, okay, this part is dedicated to program one, this part is dedicated to program two, this part is dedicated to program three, and so on and so forth, okay? And then each program usually, as I said, has different regions. We usually have a code region, a data region, uh, a heap, a stack that kind of grows, right? And, and, and so on and so forth, right? And then another thing that we can have is that we can have a portion of, of memory that is kind of shared between all of them. So let's say, for example, this part is shared. So everybody can access this part, but we know that this part is a shared part. So when I'm, when I'm, when I'm accessing this, I have to be careful that you know, other people can, other programs can also update this, okay? And then we can also reserve some of these parts. So let's say, for example, this part is reserved for the OS, okay? So I can have this kind of nice static way of, of kind of, you know, reserving and putting things in different spots, right? Some part can be shared among the programs. Some parts can be dedicated to a particular program. Some part can be reserved for a particular program and so on and so forth, okay? So that's what we kind of intuitively do. And this is what we call memory management, okay? So memory management is that, you know, uh, uh, how do we kind of, you know, assign different parts of different portion of my memory to different programs? Early days, we only had single, you know, programs machines, single, uh, single thread machines, which means that at only one program runs on my system. So I don't need to be worried about, oh, how do I isolate between programs and so on and so forth. There was just only one program, there was no OS and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, there's still lots of microcontrollers these days operating like this, that we don't really have separate programs, we just have one. But most of our modern systems, my, my mobile devices, uh, CPUs inside my processors and laptops and, and PCs and servers, these are multi-program systems. It's, it's unimaginable to think that you can only run one application, okay? You always have multiple applications running at the same time, which means that you need to kind of figure out how do you manage the memory to kind of service all of these applications, right? So this is what we call memory management. It's usually part of the, the OS, but you need architecture support. You need hardware support for that. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about that hardware support for doing the memory management, but there is an upper software layer for memory management that we're not gonna talk about. That's actually what you're gonna see in your operating system course if you ever take it. All right, so now the question becomes, how do we share the memory between multiple programs? And I already told you one, one way of doing this. That is the static 
portioning and static, you know, isolation between the programs. I have program one, program two, say, okay, from line X to Y is program one, from line Y to Z is program two, and boom, um, uh, the problem is solved, right? Uh, the problem with this is, so for, first of all, uh, the way that we're gonna, you know, make sure that the isolation is, uh, is, is satisfied is basically by making sure that, uh, uh, you know, things are, 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 are checked, right? Right. We call, we call this, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the protection or isolation property, which means that if this program tries to address something, access something here, it should be blocked by either the hardware or the operating system. And the second thing is that if the, this program wants to access things within it, we should be allowed. So that's what we call protection. And the second thing is that we should be able to move things around. Uh, in other words, it should be location independent. Otherwise, the next time we restart this program, we need to know exactly where each address is. If, for example, one operating system or one static kind of distribution decides that the program one should go here and program two goes here, and the other one decides to move this around, our program should still work. So in other words, our program should be independent of where it's located in the memory. It should still work. My addresses should, should be correct and so on and so forth, okay? In other words, at the program level, you should be oblivious to where your actual thing has been, been put, right? So that's, that's, that's two things that we need to take care of, okay? So how do we do these two things? We you do two main principles. For the first one, we are using bounds. So essentially what we do is that, for example, if program one starts here and ends here, this is going to be my bound. So usually I'm gonna have what we call a base pointer or something. So, and then like, you know, X, let's say X and Y. So if this program two trying to access any addresses that with this within this range of X and Y, I should block it. Right, so this is how we do the bound checking. And then the second thing that we do that given that we want our program to be kind of oblivious of where it's been you know, put into the memory, instead of having absolute addresses, we usually have base plus offset addresses, okay? So if my base of my program, it's the beginning of my program is here, all the addresses are relevant and offset of this base address, okay? So now what will happen, what will happen is if I manage, if I decided to move this to some other, uh, to some other address. So let's say, for example, this is my initial kind of assignment. This is my program one, and this is the base. Okay. So this address, let's say is base plus X. Okay. So now, for example, if I have another mapping where I decided, for example, to put my same program here and then my base is here, this address that I use here is still base plus X, but of course the absolute address of this is let's say Y, but the absolute address of this is Z and these two obviously are not the same. So what I'm trying to say is you never do absolute addressing. You always do base plus offset addressing because that makes this completely independent from where you put your program into your main memory. If I move this around, as, as long as I move everything all at the same time, nothing bad happens in terms of accessing it. And in other words, when you're like, for example, addressing your array A or B or C in your program, you never know where the actual address of this in your main memory, right? But everything is based on that base address from the beginning of your program, okay? So you're all set when you're doing these kind of things, okay? And then you might ask, okay, based on this kind of static addressing and this base plus offset, how do we do, do the sharing and so on? So we can actually have another layer, another part of the main memory, which we call libraries or shared libraries, when both of these programs are allowed to access them, okay? Uh, usually we do, we'll only allow them as a read-only access for security reasons, because if we allow them, both of them, to update this part of the memory, then 
Uh, again, we're going to have the same issues that I said before, that one program can impact the other program. But we can allow read-only accesses to some shared memory. So, for example, all of your standard libraries like printf, scanf, cout, cn, they're part of some libraries, and these are shared libraries. We don't copy these libraries every time that you're using them for one program. We always store them in some part of my, my memory, and whoever wants to use cout, they can just go there and use cout, right? So there's no reason that I copy like the same function over and over again. I can have a shared library and everybody just know where they are. And that's why you include them in your kind of like programs and so on. You tell the binary that, okay, use this as part of your kind of like your program, okay? But in reality, this is how it works, that we essentially have our own programs and whatever shared library we have, we just link them together. So we don't really copy them, okay? And then you might also ask, what about the OS? OS can also be considered another program really in your system. So you can actually put your operating system also somewhere here, okay? And typically you let the OS to, to access to everything else. So OS is technically accessing to this, have, you know, is allowed to access to all of these things. It's the highest level of privilege. Maybe you may want to access some of it, but not the rest of it, and so on and so forth. Depends on the on the on the model that you want to follow. But this is typically you kind of like you know partition this memory static. Okay. Any questions? So the question is, if the OS is a program itself. If you use, like, you know, you access the kernel, can you access the other processes? As I said, typically the assumption is you can, okay? So in other words, OS sees everything as part of his or its own memory address space, but there are scenarios that this may not be allowed. Uh, for example, if you have things like enclaves, uh, then that part is even not, you know, accessible by the offering system itself. Any other questions? Okay. So this is basically one option, right? So statically just say, okay, this part is yours, this part is yours, this part is here, this part is OS. You access to this, you access to that. This is your base, this is your bound, and so on and so forth, right? So this is kind of like the idea. The problem with this is that now if you think about, okay, how do I add a new program to this system, okay? And if I can add this program at the beginning part when I'm actually writing things into the memory, then I can statically create you know, space for it. But if things happen dynamically, for example, if you're in your operating system, you decide to open Spotify or, or, or another, you know, you know, another tab in your browser and so on and so forth, these are these are can be considered as a new program, but you didn't really reserve the space for them beforehand, right? So you need to kind of dynamically being able to adjust your your memory, your mapping, uh, to kind of allow for putting things into the into the system. Okay, so that's a big problem with this static because what if you don't have available spaces? Okay. The second problem with this static approach is what if a program needs more space, okay? If you remember, for example, if you have things like stack that kind of grows, and what if, for example, one program wants to load a lot of data and the other program doesn't want to load many data? And what if we don't know beforehand how much data is going to be loaded into this program? If we knew, okay, maybe I can assign more spaces. But if I didn't know, if I didn't know during the actual writing that how much data is going to be loaded, then how can I actually statically kind of assign proper amount of storage to my program, okay? So these are the two main issues with this static approach that I cannot add more programs dynamically and I cannot grow or shrink the size of the program once I kind of assign the static space. So what was the other option? Of course, the opposite of static is doing some form of dynamic partitioning, right? So the dynamic partitioning is basically based on this, this concept called page. And this is 
uh, what we are using in all model systems, is that instead of like thinking about this memory as this kind of one unified things, like divide it into smaller pieces, which we call pages, which essentially just a consecutive blocks of addresses. So let's say we typically have like four kilobytes of consecutive addresses and we call that one page. And then assign these pages to different programs. And then since now I have this smaller granularity, I can now assign different pages to different programs. If a new program comes, I can assign less pages or more pages. I can remove pages from one and assign the pages to another and so on and so forth. So this is the story of using pages and this is how we do the memory management. Uh, let me give you more, more, more uh, detailed example. Let's say if you have three different programs, we're gonna divide the program into pages. Let's say for example, uh, each program has four different pages um, and typically each page is four kilobytes. This is kind of a standard number. Uh, in more modern systems, we also have two options, like we have huge pages and we have regular pages, but in most cases, pages are four kilobytes of data. Uh, and you usually, if you want to know whether the data is in one page or another page, all you need to do is checking the lower 12 bits of your address to decide what is your page, right? Where you are in your page. Uh, because four kilobytes is 12 bits. Uh, all right, so this is how we're gonna then kind of like look into the same memory that I showed you before. I can basically say that, okay, I can scatter these pages into this to this memory. I can scatter this into this memory, scatter this. Operating system itself can be divided into the pages. And now you can see that I can actually have much more flexibility in order to kind of assign and remove. If for example, program C ended, I can just go and remove all these kind of like pinkish page, you know, pages from my, from my memory and, and assign it to another one. If I, for example, this program wants to grow, I can assign more pages and all those things, okay? And the given that I don't need a continuous blocks because now pages are independent from each other gives me an extra level of flexibility because now I can kind of find empty spaces and interleave them together. But of course, the biggest question is that how do I know what is stored where, right? Because now I basically telling you that pages can be anywhere in my, in my program memory, right? In my main memory. Uh, previously, I knew the bounds and I knew the checks, but now I'm telling you that I don't know anything about them, right? Um, and that's kind of like the biggest problem with the pages. Any questions so far? Okay. So how do we actually keep track of what is the what page where where each page is? Uh, well, like for each given program. Where do we store the pages? Uh, we're gonna use a table to kind of keep track of these things, okay? If I have a table for per process, per program, if I have one dedicated table that tells me where did I store the first address of that page, uh, then I can easily recover my pages, right? So we call this thing a page table, okay? The page table is basically gonna give you this this notion of just, just basically just, you don't need to store the entire uh, page. You just need to store the beginning address, just the address itself. So just a 32-bit value, assuming that this is a 32-bit value. Uh, I just store 32-bit value per page in my, in my prog per program. So for example, if my program has four pages, I store four 32-bit values. And this is kind of pointing to the beginning of that page in the main memory, okay? So if I have this, then that's great. Then I'm gonna have basically a page table per process, and that tells me where they're stored. If I move them around, I'll go to that page table and, and update that and so on and so forth, okay? So this is why we need what we call a page table. Um, but then the page table is gonna give me an additional problem, and that's the idea of what we call virtual addresses, okay? So what is a virtual address? Uh, so virtual address is this thing uh, that when we are writing our programs, okay, and actually you can think about when you're writing your programs, you never think about page tables, you never think about 
where my program is stored, how many pages do I have, and so on and so forth. What you think and you assume that you have is the entire memory at your disposal, right? So from programmer's point of view, we always have this illusion that my memory is unified, I have access to entire memory, and everything is continuous, right? So I do address zero, and then I do address one, and do address two. But what I just show you is that this is actually quite kind of segmented and fragmented, and things are not really consecutive and not continuous, and you not have all the memory in the world, and so on and so forth. So why there is this and how do we fix this? So why programmers has this view and how do we translate it in real hardware? That's the idea of what we call a virtual memory versus a physical memory, okay? So in virtual memory, basically in our program address space, we always assume that everything starts from address zero, zero, right? So we always think that, okay, the first address is probably zero, zero, and then we move, move forward from there. If I do A0 and then A1, they're probably part of the same address. So I can actually manipulate the addresses this way, right? So this is what we call uh, uh, a virtual address. And of course, this is just an illusion. This is not reality. It's what's really implemented in hardware. But we have this abstraction label of virtual addresses for, for those reasons. Uh, so since I have this, then now I need what we call a virtual to physical address translation because my real data is, is stored in real hardware in real physical addresses. Like address zero is literally here and address like, I don't know, 200 is somewhere here, right? But in my program, I have program A that has addresses zero and one and two and three. And I have another program, program B, that also has address 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay? And obviously, these are two separate things. So I need to find a way that translate this virtual address into what we call a physical address. The real address is that actually your data is sold. And I need to do this for every single process, for every single access that I have, okay? So the big thing in, in all of our systems, in all of our processors, is that we need to translate this virtual address, the address that comes from our programs into a physical physical address. Uh, that is the address that's really stored the actual data that we are looking for. And this has to be done in the hardware because for one hardware to another hardware, the way that this kind of mapping is happening is changing and depends on this page table, okay? So, so think about this is this way that we're gonna have a separate table, which is the virtual address table, v0, v1, v2. And now think about that basically your pages, your virtual pages is translated into this physical tables in physical addresses. So there's this address translation from v0 to p0. And then we query this page table to actually know where this address is really stored. And this is where really this data is stored, okay? So that's where we're gonna access this. So every load in reality is basically a translation from virtual address to physical address, accessing my page table to know where this is really stored, and then actually doing all those things that I discussed before, okay? So all those things that I said, that, oh, the address from CPU comes to the cache, and the cache kind of checks this, and then goes to the main memory, those were all physical addresses. But in reality, there are two more steps that happens before this, and the, the virtual to physical translation and then physical to checking the page table translation before actually doing any of these things that we are doing in my caches and my, my main, main memory, okay? So let's actually do see how this virtual to physical works. And then how do we actually kind of implement and build this physical page tables, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so our program lifecycle is that I have programs, I have virtual addresses, I have physical addresses, and then I have the main memory, okay? Uh, and as I said, to kind of like show you another kind of view of this, every program thinks that I have the entire to the power of 32, right? Uh, my addresses are all 32 bits. And program A thinks the same thing as program B and program C. But as I said, this is not true, okay? 
in reality, my physical memory is actually a limited space. And this is what we purchase, right? So for example, if you buy one gigabyte of memory, right? You will have two to the power of 30, 30 lines, right? You actually don't have two to the power of 32 even. You have less than that, right? So you cannot assume that you have the entire memory. Uh, you have much, much less. But of course, if you update and upgrade your physical memory and you add more things, you will have more and more spaces, right? Uh, so how, do, how does this, this uh, virtual address works, okay? So this translation is is through this kind of like you know uh, uh, this this table or address translation table, where essentially the idea is this that my virtual address okay is combination of two things my virtual page number and my page offset okay, and then what we really need to do is that we need to kind of translate this virtual page number into what we call a physical page number. And my page offset actually can be just used the same way. So let me go back here. If, if you remember, I told you that usually my page size is four kilobytes, okay? Four kilobytes, okay? And since I still need byte addressability, we never get rid of that byte addressability. If I have a page that is four kilobytes, and if I want to have byte addressability here, I need what we call page offset, okay? To kind of know where my byte is within that four kilobytes. Again, why it's 12 bits? Because I have four kilobytes. Four kilobytes means, you know, two to the power of 12, which means that I need 12 bits, okay? And we call that 12 bit page offset. Within a page, any number between zero to the two power of 11 minus, two to the power of 12 minus one is the byte that I'm looking for, okay? So we call that page offset, and we don't need to translate that. We can always assume that my virtual address is also paged, same size of my physical, and data within my virtual address is the same continuous four kilobytes of data. So that in other words, I don't need to translate the page offset part. I always assume that I do chunks of four kilobytes, four kilobytes in virtual address and physical address the same. So this part basically doesn't need any translation. The part that requires translation is the remaining bits of my data, okay? So typically, if I have a 32-bit number, this n is 32. And this m is depends on how big my, my DRAM is, my, my main memory is, OK? Uh, if my main memory is also 32, then its m is also 32. If it's less than that, it could be less than that. It doesn't matter, OK? So my virtual address size is 2 to the power of n. My physical address size is 2 to the power of m. And of course, my page size is two to the power of P, okay? And that's why I'm saying that usually this P is 12. So usually we need 12 bits for page offset. Anybody has any question about page offset? We're good? So we have four kilobytes of data. I need by that receivability, so I need page offset, okay? So let's see how this translation works. Uh, so this translation is basically just a one-to-one -one mapping of, 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 of a table, okay? So going back to this kind of graph here, if this is my program A, I'm going to say that, okay, the moment I create this program, I know all these virtual addresses. So I'm going to basically remember where did I store V0. And I'm going to call that you know, the, 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 the translation address, the P0 address. Then I'm going to do the same for V1. I'm going to do the same for P2 and, and P3 and so on. So this is kind of the address lookup that we do in order to know where this address is stored. And I said, this is what we call a page table, okay? So this page table basically tells me that this given virtual address page is stored and is assigned to this particular address in the physical memory space. And all the, all, and the only thing that we need to really store is the, the beginning address. So everything else we can just, just add with the block offset, right? Uh, 
So to give you an example, let's say, for example, our virtual address memory space is 2 to the power of 32 because we have 32-bit value addresses. But let's say, for example, we only have 256 megabytes of memory. And let's say my page size are 12 bits. Okay, my page size are 4 kilobytes. Uh, so as you can see, this means that my virtual addresses are 32. My physical addresses are 28. My page offset is 12. Uh, uh, the number of virtual pages is going to be 2 to the power of 32 divided by the size of each page, which is 4. So I'm going to have 2 to the power of 20 or, or 20 bits for my virtual page number. And I'm going to have 2 to the power of 16, the 2 to the power of 28 divided by 2 to the power of 12. And this is the number of page, physical pages that I have. In other words, I need 16. So in other words, I need to have a table that takes this 20-bit number and translate this into a 16-bit number. And I have a one-to-one -one mapping of this for each different programs. And we repeat this for every program, okay? So if I have 10 programs, I will have a 10 different page tables for each one. For each virtual address page, I'm going to have a corresponding physical address page uh, that's translated a 20-bit number to a 16-bit number. Does that make sense? And then this physical, this page offset is just telling which byte within this page is you're going to use, okay? So this is how the page table looks. Uh, this is my virtual page number. As I said, P is just a page offset. Uh, using this address, we use it as the index. So VPN is basically an index to this page. Here, I'm going to have the actual page, uh, physical page number. So the content here is this PPN. And as I said, this page offset just go directly goes into this part. So my physical address is combination of the whatever content that I'm storing here concatenated with this page offset. This together gives me the physical address, okay? So, and uh, two to the power of, uh, so this, this, the number of rows here is basically based on the number of pages, virtual pages that I have. Within each, I have the actual physical number. I'm gonna use that in order to translate this virtual address to this physical address, okay? And then as I said, this is like a full table. So it's not like I'm storing part of it or some of it. For every single entry, there is a, a row in this table, okay? So there is no issue of, oh, there is no nothing there and so on and so forth. And then usually what we do is that, as I said, uh, we have per process page tables. So if I have two different programs, I have two different page tables. What I do is usually I use a base register in order to tell me where the beginning address is, right? Where this page table is stored. So from one process to another process, this is actually one consecutive table, but like this part is for program one and this part is program program two and so on and so forth. Okay, and how do we distinguish between them based on this base register? So this is for program A, this is for program B, and if I have more, I'm going to add more, okay? Uh, another thing that we store in the page table is, is, is some flags, okay? The reason that we store these flags is to tell me whether this page can be writable, can be only readable, can someone else, you know, access it, can someone modify it, and so on and so forth. In order to kind of check those uh, kind of sharing between the pages, I can use this flag. So while I'm doing the virtual to physical translation, I can also populate this flag. So remember I told you that, for example, my memory could be, this is one program, this is another program, and this part is shared. So when I'm doing the address translation for this shared part, I can say, for example, everybody can access this in a read-only fashion. Or now I can even have another, uh, you know, page here that is shared among these two, right? And then there I'm going to, for example, say that this is the flag, the shared flag for this is equal to one. 
which means that everybody else can access this. Or maybe I can have even more. For example, I can say, oh, program one can write to this page, but maybe program two cannot, and so on and so forth. So essentially, I can add any sort of you know, permissions in, into this flags, and I can store them with the physical address. So whenever I do the translation, I read those values as well. So these are kind of auxiliary bits that I stored with my page table, okay? Uh, who is the owner? Can I execute this? Is it read-only? Is it writable? All those things, different things. And this is what you're going to learn more when you're taking an offering system course. That's why I'm really not going to the details of it, okay? So now the question becomes, where should I store the page table? Because page table seems to be this very, very giant table, right? And I have one entry per virtual address. So where should I store the page table itself? And the first thing that comes to the mind is that we can actually store the page table within the memory itself, okay? So page table is what we use in order to kind of uh, know the mapping inside the memory, but you can actually store the page table within the memory itself. Uh, so in other words, every access, every real access becomes two access. The first access is for going to the page table and bringing the physical address. The second access is like the regular access that we had before, the going to the, the physical address and bringing the actual data, okay? So it's very important to know that the impact of page table means that you're kind of doubling in some sense the, the amount of uh, time it takes for you to go to the main memory, okay? Uh, but let's also think about how large a page table is, okay? Going back to the example that I gave you that I have two to the power of 20 virtual page numbers, and I have 28-bit address for physical addresses. Uh, if I actually look into this kind of numbers of 28 minus offsets and so on, it, it's, it's usually around 32 bits per entry for the physical address plus the flags and everything else that we have. And if I have two to the power of 20 of these, it means that page table per process itself is four megabytes of data that needs to be stored, okay? And actually things get significantly worse if we move from 32-bit data to 64-bit data, this number actually explodes significantly, right? So, what I'm trying to tell you here is that page table itself, if I want to have one page table per process, I'm dealing, I need to deal with four megabytes of storage data in my memory. And now if I have 10 different programs, we are talking about 10 megabytes of data that needs to, uh, 40, 40 megabytes of data that needs to be stored in my memory. Huge amount of overhead, right? So how to compress the page tables? That's the story that we're gonna talk about in the next lecture, okay?